We are back for Caravan of Garbage because we are talking 2020 apocalypse movies. Movies set in 2020 that weren't made in 2020. A fun apocalypse. One that, sure, you could cancel, hypothetically. Mm. But you might have a bit of a biffo leading up, you know? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I just want to say straight up, mm -hmm. I, have a, I have an apology to make. Because in a previous one of these videos, I think it was the Reign of Fire video. You didn't leave a like? Oh, I as, should rectify that. As and everybody should, is required to do? I like, I'll leave a like on this one as well. You and everyone else. But also... In that video, I think I was mentioning ridiculous names mm. and I referred to someone in this movie as Striker Pentecost. Yes. An obviously ridiculous name, <laughs> but I need to apologise because that's not his name. I misremembered it. His name is, in fact, the completely normal Stacker Pentecost. <laughs> you idiot. I'm such an idiot, right? How are you on the name Raleigh Beckett? I hate it. Me too. They're all bad. I mean, it's a real name, mm. apparently. Uh -huh. yeah, but yeah. it sounds like a made-up Australian name. Raleigh! Raleigh! <laughs> The dog's at it again. The dog's at it again. What's it doing? Probably written something. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Can we talk? We should probably maybe talk about this off the back. Sure. Maybe the Australians in this movie. There are Australians in this movie? Evidently there are, yeah. There are two Australian characters in this in this movie. Yes. The actors are, there are a Brit and an American. Yep. And they have what I would consider to be the worst Australian accents ever committed to film. Wow. But I have a theory about it. What's that? So I would say you and I have like fairly typical... Australian accents. Yeah. But I'm sure there's people out there who are like, no, 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 no. I've heard Australians speak. I've met Australians and you all sound like Crocodile Dundee. Yeah, that's Guess right. Guess what, people out there? We tricked you. <laughs> because that's what we do. When Australians go overseas, the Australian accent, it gets bigger turn and up, broader mate. and dumber. Yeah. Right? We, t we turn on the Australian charm to either get you into bed or into one of our fabulous zoos. <laughs> Crikey. What's happened to these characters is that they have gone overseas to yep. Hong Kong and they're like, here we go. Going to go to the nightclubs, <laughs> going to put on a bit of true blue Aussie charm, and I'm going to reel in the ladies. And one of them goes out into the nightclub, and he's like, uh, g'day, darling. What's a, what's a top sheila like you doing at a place like this? And she's like, you know there's a thousand-foot-tall monster outside, and he's headbutting the city to pieces. And so he's had to just keep upping the ante until he's like, truth, stone the crows, Margaret. <laughs> Anyway, it's bad. But that's not what this movie is about. No, it's really not what this movie is about because it's an international cast and crew doing a variety of accents, isn't mm, it? That's right. I didn't love this when I first saw it. I was uh -huh. kind of a bit underwhelmed by it because I was really looking forward to it considering who was involved and the ideas behind it. Yeah, Del Toro. That's right. Did you find it was an interesting choice for him to make? Yeah, well, he's having watched a bunch of behind-the-scenes stuff. He grew up with manga and anime and all yes. these, and these giant kind of kaiju movies and things like that. Amazing and, as he yeah. was, a, was a very popular... Uh, Japanese animation, mm. which is also popular in Mexico, which is where he's from. So. Right, so there you go. Yeah. So revisiting it, I, I definitely liked it more. But a big part of this is the lead for me has an accent, an unplaceable American accent, which I find distracting. I think Charlie Hunnam is great. Mm -hmm. Recently, The Gentleman, of course, Sons of Anarchy, a show that I haven't really seen. But he is good, but I think it falls down a bit in the lead department, this movie. Unlike the sequel, which I do want to talk about, which I think has a stronger lead, mostly also because he keeps his original accent. I love the world, though. Yeah. Like, right. I love what they've crafted. But, I mean, what would, make, what would make him a more compelling lead? Even more brothers that died. Excellent, great. Yeah, more tragedy. Raleigh and Yancey. <laughs> That's their names. Nice. We should also point out that that section of the film is set in 2020 and the rest of the film is set in 2025. So we're only going to discuss the initial action sequence with Raleigh and Yancey. <laughs> but speaking of like design and things like that, I love like the weight of the Jaegers. They take like a second to kind of respond. You've got to kind of drag like the fist into, into battle. The second one, they're just kind of spinning madly, the second movie. Yeah, right, uh-huh. Uh, but I, I enjoy the personality that they kind of worked into the designs from the different cultures and they all do different things. Well, look, I agree with you that it's they, they all look great mm. and they all do different things but I think if I was some sort of uh, Jaeger technician in, in the future fighting a war against these yeah. bizarre aliens I'd probably focus less on like cool anime aesthetics <laughs> and more on maybe like a plasma gun that takes less than a full minute to charge <laughs> sure because that's that's all that's the only thing that works yeah it seems is to is a big laser gun or well, some missiles or a sword that you have or a big sword that you have <laughs> so focus on those focus yeah. less on like big arms that can be easily mm. torn off or legs yeah. or exposed heads just a big sphere just I a big sphere that shoots plasma I think if you've got like a giant redwood and sharpened it yes. and just catapulted it through one of their heads <laughs> I think that would do it yep. well they've got multiple brains so a trebuchet is what you're suggesting that's exactly what I'm saying I'm yeah. saying look if you get big enough Ewoks 
You could probably <laughs> sort this situation. Well, that's what they didn't. Didn't a philosopher say that once? If, if you get a big enough Ewok, you can move the world. You know, I enjoy. You're not supposed to think about that. No, that's exactly. not the point. Look, it's not like, well, why didn't they do well, this? You're not supposed to, the fighting. You're not supposed to think about it, but we will just briefly, and then we'll get back to the fighting. Ultimately, what they probably should have done, because they know when the kaiju are coming out of the earth. Yeah. Like they can time it to the minute it seems. Yes. So just put a big bomb down there, and when the kaiju come out, blow it up, mm. and then. Put another one there. Yeah. Wait, you know? Put a grate over the top yes. just made of swords so they just slide out <laughs> through it. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, like a slap chop. Yeah, <laughs> like a slap chop. I think how it should have ended, I think, did that exact thing oh, in their video. Goodness. Like, I try not to rewatch a bunch of stuff in reviews before these because I'll just start retreading points that other people make. Yeah, right. But again, like, speaking of the design, for, for the monsters, the kaiju, I like the personality of them. There's, like, a big crocodile one. There's a crab one. There's one that turns into, like, a bat with there's wings. There's a knife head. Oh, yeah, there's a knife head. They get, they're running out of names, aren't they? Nope. <laughs> they are. All right. <laughs> they're also technically designed that you could fit a man inside them, like the monster movies of old, which were just people yeah, in suits. Yeah, for sure. I feel like every modern day monster movie should have a moment in it where you've got the good guy robot running through the city and the monster charging at him as well and the lightning is and the rain is coming down. I think you should just cut to two dudes in rubber suits <laughs> in a cardboard city and just a flickering strobe light just for like two seconds <laughs> Yeah. and then cuts back and then we pretend nobody's noticed it. I would, I would thoroughly yeah. enjoy that. But yeah. you're right. And I, I believe during the press tour, they did actually get people in like rubber knife head suits oh, cool. to pose okay. the kind of kind of silly, super deformed morals to, to... That's awesome. Yeah. Because the way also, the, the mechanics of the world, they go out of their way to make it physically makes sense. There's a lot of like gears and cogs that you see shifting inside the robots. Obviously they're 3D models, but they're designed in a way that the arm won't clip through its shoulder when it moves. Like it has to yeah, move right, uh -huh. mechanically the right way. So what you're saying is we could 3D print these and make them ourselves. Yes, that's right. Nice. And get them to fight a big Ewok. I'll see you in the backyard. <laughs> but it's not just the, the creature designs that they go into. The idea that they built the piloting sets. They're really exposed in there. It's not like a tight little cabin, like an X-Wing where you're snug, where you're mm, snug yeah, in yeah. there. You're in this big kind of janky room, <laughs> oh, yes. which is rattling about and you're getting water, like tons of water poured over you. You're strapped into this giant mechanism and it could just bust through. And suddenly you're in this like giant rocking exposed room, which was apparently like four stories high and could drop 15 feet in an instant. And that's huh. how they filmed all of those sequences. Did they build it out of one of those uh, rides at Dreamworld? <laughs> that's right, yeah. Where they zip you up to the top and then drop yeah. you. Yeah, but even in things like, you know, the, the flashback where Marco's in the street and the, and it's shaking was designed to when the creature's foot would hit the ground, the whole the whole set would shake. Oh, so things that's like practical, that, yeah. interesting. There's a lot of money in this movie, I think, is spent to great effect, including the voice of GLaDOS. Ellen McLean. That's right. Mm -hmm. Make Portal 3, you fucks. Anyway, I also love the idea that they've got giant mechanical robots and you need minimal two people to pilot them, sometimes mm -hmm. three. Yep. Because it's a left brain, right brain situation. If one person does it, it'll melt you down. It's a non-traditional number of, uh, of mecha pilots. Sure. Normally one or five. <laughs> right, okay. But it's not unheard of. Yeah, that's true. It does happen. Mm -hmm. But also I feel like you could just use the PlayStation control. Like, I feel like that would be <laughs> right. enough. Uh -huh. You could wire one of those in. You program in the Arkham Combat. <laughs> you just go for it. <laughs> you just hit dodge. They'd never hit you. That's right, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I still, I love the idea that, that they still have to physically be in it. Really it make the effort to move. Very good for cardio. You know what I do like character-wise in this movie? Mm -hmm. I like the little scientist team that having a little fun adventure. So, uh, I think so that's Charlie Day from yeah, Always that's Sunny. Right. Burn Gorman, the other guy. But yeah, I, I like their, their little adventures. I think that's the most compelling plot in the movie. And they're trying to... One of them's trying to drift with a kaiju to kind of figure out what's going on and then interact with Ron Perlman and, and all of that. And I think that's that stuff is, is very interesting. I have a note here that says um, one of Ron Perlman's shoes is bigger than Charlie Day's whole body. <laughs> and I'm, I'm right there with you, Charlie Day. How big is Ron Perlman really? He's a big man. <laughs> but is he though? No, I don't think he's big. Because I've also heard he's not that angles. big. Yeah, yeah. But he's big. But how big is he? He's Hollywood big. Yeah. He's bigger than everyone else in Hollywood. And they are not that big, except for The Rock. And Liam Neeson. Yep. Well, apparently the idea behind Hollywood is, and our friend Hollywood Pete told us this, to be a movie star, you need a tiny little skinny body and a giant head. He calls it the Clooney effect. Plays well on, on a big screen. Exactly. Mm -hmm, that's yeah. right. But for me, though, this movie really peaks in that middle battle. And the finale 
that's set underwater. It, it does. It doesn't drag a quite bit. match it, does yeah, it? Yeah, you're right. Uh huh. That idea that they're fighting that creature, which turns out to have wings, and the reveal of the big floppy sword, which becomes a big stiff sword, is it a metaphor? Probably for dicks. But what I'm talking about is <laughs> yes. That whole sequence in, with the battleship, like G Gypsy Danger picks up a yeah, battleship, wielding it like a katana. How yeah. does it stay together? It doesn't matter. It's not important. Mm -hmm. That was good stuff. That kind of there's the a little moment where uh, the mecha's hand goes through an, an entire yeah. building and. Tips an executive toy. That was a funny moment I enjoyed. Well, that's practical. Oh. That whole sequence is just, it's phenomenal. That That's what makes this movie for me. And just the neon city in the background and the rain that's coming off all the creatures and the, and the robots. It's, it's really something else. And it has wings. You don't think it's got wings? It's got I wings, It's got though. wings, yeah. Yeah. The finale, yeah, it's just kind of, it's just like... Ugh. It's a bit Independence Day resurgence. I don't know. Just a bit kind of... We got to get into their lair, which might have happened in that movie. I don't know. Independence <laughs> Day research. I can't remember. But it's a bit kind of... A bit drawn out. It's... Shh. You can't fault it as a movie for having big monsters fighting big robots. That's absolutely If that's right. what you want going into this, then yeah, that's what, that's what you're getting. But I'd love to get specific, specific rim, if you don't mind. <laughs> about the, About the universe. We're not doing trivia this week. Are we doing specific rim? A specific rim. Thank God, because we've, we've gone months without doing a, a, a round of specific rim. <laughs> so I'm glad we're bringing it in finally. I'd like to talk about the sequel, which I feel, again, has the stronger lead in John Boyega. Mm -hmm. Look, I don't think it's a better movie, but I do really enjoy that sequel as also a natural progression of the first one because it does have the little scientist subplot. Charlie Day's gone mad from drifting with, with, with the, kaiju, it, with the yeah. kaiju. Yeah, yeah. And I think that whole story element's really interesting of how the, the Jaegers have... Um, have the kaiju brains in them and it's a whole new invasion plan and at the end they're like we're going to take the fight to you no you're not but you know <laughs> Indep uh, independence day resurgence it, that's that's exactly it the weight of the jaegers is gone in that movie and i feel like you could put that down to well maybe they're faster because it's been x number of years yeah right until uh -huh. the next one but i do think that movie is better than people give it credit for it's also Stephen esther knight who's worked of course on daredevil that's right um yeah. i think it's i think it's underrated as a sequel it's amazing to me they made it because the first one made money internationally which is how they got the opportunity to kind of flesh it out a bit but yet yeah, that the second one didn't land as well as the first one did i'll be honest james mm. i i just had to wait until you finished saying all that to let you know that I don't remember the second one at all. Okay. Like not a single. I did rewatch it for this. I see. And that it's makes a it's sense. a brisk fun time. I feel. Okay then. Yeah. Mm. Okay. So there was also forgetting specific room. There's also an animated series announced in 2014 that would have taken place before the events of the first film, acting as a bridge between film number one and film number two. It would focus on established background characters that would have appeared in the sequel. That project ended up dead. There's also been a number of comics. There's Uprising, Aftermath. Tales from the Drift. And then, of course, what is happening at the moment, there's a Pacific Rim Netflix series, an anime, which is the most expensive anime that Netflix have ever done. And it will follow a brother and sister twin team piloting an abandoned Jaeger across hostile territory in search of their parents. Okay, well, guys, you have one more chance to put in my rubber suit idea, mm. then you're dead to me. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Just live action in the middle of an anime? Yes. I love it. Why do you think, though, this never quite took off, like, commercially or even critically on the whole? It's not terribly received, but it was never like, this is, like, the thing. You know what I mean? Yeah, I don't know. Mm. And I, it's got all the elements, it right? It does have all the elements. You've mentioned in this there are a lot of practical effects in this and mm. a lot of real sets and a lot of real mechanisms and stuff like that. But to me, it never really felt that real. Okay. It looks good. Yeah. But it never felt... It, I, I, don't have the, I don't feel it ever had that impact for me. To me, it never really had... Like a real... A big rocket fist? Because it did have that. It did have that, but it didn't feel like a real rocket fist <laughs> really hitting me in my alien nuts. You know what I mean? <laughs> sure, yeah. It didn't feel... I wanted to feel visceral. Sure, okay. Like real and solid, and it never felt that solid to me. You want people in suits? No, there's got to be a happy medium. <laughs> sure, yeah. One person in a suit fighting a, a robot, a real robot. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just a man in one of those puffy suits that they used to train attack dogs, <laughs> and he's being attacked by a bunch of those Boston Dynamic robots. With that machetes taped to their heads. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Great. You could probably do that for less than $150 million too. Definitely. I'm sure the question that everybody wants answered is, what happened to Raleigh Beckett though? He didn't appear in the sequel. That's true. I have your answers though. Oh, is, it, is this in the spinoff or the comics or something? No, this is from Stephen S. Knight, the director. This is what was going to happen with the character and oh, where we right, might right. see Raleigh Beckett in the future. Mm -hmm. There was a version that we shot where what happened to him was explained and talked about. This is in the sequel. We tested it and people had more questions, so we decided that we didn't want to lock ourselves into anything like, oh, he's dead or he's retired, which seemed a little cheap. 
We wanted to leave it open for a third installment of the movie in case we needed Charlie Hunnam back. The only reason that Charlie Hunnam is not in the movie is because of scheduling problems. So he was off making a different movie. That's why he wasn't in the first place. So yeah, I don't think we will see it, but you know, there you go. In summary, just just shoot a big spike through one of their heads though. Just a, just a big spike. I have some miscellaneous notes here. Just a couple I love it, week. I love it, I love um, it, I love it. This one just says, um, hey, the pilot's helmets are all full of pea soup. Yes. An yet another movie that explains what an EMP is. Yeah. Uh, pretty good. What is it? Oh, it's going to be like a Ben's going to put up like it's gonna a... going to put in, in it, yeah. Really. Maybe a montage from every movie that's <laughs> featured in EMP. I don't know. You can do it. If anyone can do it. If anyone can... could do it. Yeah. They could definitely do it. <laughs> an electromagnetic pulse. Electromagnetic pulse. Electromagnetic pulse. Electromagnetic pulse. Oh, you mean an M. Um, I don't like the name of the uh, the Australian uh, Jaeger. Look, I watched it really late at night and I made mm. these notes really late at night. I think that's what this means because I've written a note that just says, strike a Eureka, less than sign, crikey Murrumbina. <laughs> and after that I've written, is that anything? <laughs> so who knows, if you've yeah, got a better name. that's definitely something. Look, here's the thing about next week for Caravan of Garbage. Mm. Mm. We're currently in the middle of a 2020 pandemic. What? Non-monster related as of so far. Mm. But, you know, time will tell. Yeah, fingers crossed. 2020 eh? isn't over yet. It might never end. We might, it might clock over and it's like December 32nd. What the hell? <laughs> so the thing is, movies are going to be pushed back, it would seem. Mm. We're still unsure of the release dates of a number of blockbusters. So we're going to throw it open to people here in the comments to what people want us to talk about next. Here's some ideas that we had. The first three Transformers movies. Some Alan Moore adaptations including V for Vendetta, set in 2020. There we go. People keep saying Demolition Man. What do you want to see? What year is that set in? We could say it's set in 2020. Doesn't matter. We could do a whole video where we, where we review Demolition Man and we just say it's set in 2020 That's right. every couple of minutes and people get really mad at us. Pick a movie that you like <laughs> and we'll say it's set in 2020 and we'll just review it like that. We don't give a shit. We don't care. We don't care. What we do care about is BigSandwich.co where no matter what the video is next week that's coming, you get it early there. That's it's a little right. bloody subscription thing that we've set up. Bonus podcast, ad-free feed, early videos. It's bloody, it's got it all. It's always 2020 in there. Oh my God, why would you say that? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I'm doing the big sell, Mason. Oh, sorry, you're right. <laughs> 2020 will definitely end if you subscribe to bigsandwich.co. Correct. So we leave, we, we leave us in your very capable YouTube comment hands. Terrible idea, but that's what we're doing. No, no, YouTube comments have never let us down, James. Now you let me down constantly. Every third one is mean. Oh, I don't read them. <laughs> so I actually have no basis of fact. <laughs> All right, guys, we'll see you next week for whatever that is. Uh, grab that gem, you guys. We'll see you real soon. Yeah.